getting nerds, we are explaining parts of Iron 4. This one's probably going to be a quick one. Uh, I'm just going to go over construction. So this is the construction screen. This is going to have everything... This is going to show you everything that you're working on with your buildings. With your, your civilian factories, rather. Uh, up here, you've got your total number of factories. 14 is the number in use. Uh, 34 is the number... Uh, is the total. Factories live in states on the map. I'll show you that in a second. You also get your number here from trade and your your number owned. You add these all together and that's your total. Um, when you trade for goods, you give uh, the country that you're trading for the goods use of one of your civilian factories and hopefully the goods compensate for that. Um, this is your construction, your global construction speed bonus. That is mostly going to come from laws and technologies. And these are where your production, li your construction lines go. So similar to how we've got these production lines over here in the production queue, in the construction queue, we've got construction lines. And I'm going to show you how they work. Similar to the production queue, they fill in from top to bottom. So you'll notice we've got uh, 20 factories unused. Now, with the exception of consumer goods, trade, and projects, uh, no individual construction project can have more than 15 civilian factories allocated to it. Um, this is the civilian factories button. So suppose I want to build a civilian factory in the greater London area. I'm going to click the civilian factories button. I'm going to click on the state. You see this yellow hash? That means the number is being uh, increased. Um, if you see blue hashes instead, that means the number is being increased as much as it can. And if you see solid blue, that means all the building slots are built. I'll talk about building slots in a second. So I'm going to queue up another one over here uh, in the same place. Oop, actually, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to queue it up in the West Midlands. And this is just to show you how this works. So you notice before we had 20 civilian factories free. Now we have none. All of them are in use. And we got uh, 15 allocated to this construction project here in the greater London area and then five allocated to this one in the West Midlands. So that's the difference. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say you can only allocate 15 uh, factories to one project. And as you can see, it's filling them in from top to bottom here. So if I had north of 30 factories, uh, they would be, I would, I would have 15 on each of these two and an additional, uh, additional factories on the military factory in Yorkshire. So that's the interface. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, what's actually going on with this. So first, the consumer goods. Uh, and this, if you mouse over this, you get a handy breakdown of why your consumer goods are what they are. So with our current economic policy, the people expect 29% of our 48 civilian and military factories to produce consumer goods. This need is filled by our 34 civilian factories, leaving us with 20 factories where 20 can be used for trade. Um, so what this means is that, ah, uh, stay hydrated kids. There's a total number of civilian factories that need to be allocated to consumer goods. And that's based on your economy. And you can see it down here at the bottom here. Um, base expectation for civilian economy is 35% and our high stability reduces the percentage, uh, by 15.8%. Multiplying all the factors together, you get 84%, um, and 29% is 84% of 35%. I know that math sounds kind of wonky, but it is what it is. Um, over the course of the game, you're going to get more and more factors involved in this, and the uh, base number is going to fluctuate with your economy law, which we'll talk about in a later explainer. For now, though, uh, let's talk about trade. Um, I'm going to go over to the trade tab here, and we'll suppose that I'm a little short on fuel, so I'm going to purchase two civilian factories worth of oil from the United States. That's going to put some extra oil in my uh, my pot here. In fact, that that wasn't. I only imported 16. This just normalized itself. Um, it, it makes sense in context. Trade's kind of funny that way. 
I should have unpaused and repaused before the video started so that, that would be easier. Anyway, let me do one more so that you can see how it should look. So this is going to go up by 8 to 66. So now you can see here that the number of civilian factories being allocated to the uh, construction project in the West Midlands has gone down to 2. And 3 have been devoted here to trade in this line item here. Um, this is where all traded goods show up. And like consumer goods, they always sit at the top of the uh, construction queue. Next, there's projects. So for example, suppose we want to found an intelligence agency. This costs 5 civilian factories for 30 days. We'll call it MI6 create the agency. So the agency is being formed and now five civilian factories are allocated to that. That means there are none allocated to the project in the West Midlands and 12 allocated to the one in the Greater London area. So that's what's going on with that. And you can see that special projects has got a line item here as well. Um, if I go down to my decisions and go down to grow rubber plantations in Nigeria, it says for 180 days civilian factory use three. Um, that's also going to place a line item here under special projects. Um, if there was not one already, and if there was, it would just add this number to here and you'd be able to see it when you mouse over this. You had agency creation for five, and if I'd hit that button, we'll just go ahead and speed forward to that day uh, so that I can press that button. So now I'm going to grow rubber plantations in Nigeria. And that's going to put this at 8. And you can see there's uh, two line items there now. One for creating the agency and one for growing the rubber plantations. So this, this screen kind of fully breaks down what you're building. But there is more to do that because we got a whole bunch of buttons over here. And I'm going to introduce you to all of those buttons. Uh, I'm going to go from the bottom to the top because we're going to get Mm, am I going to do that? Yeah, I think it's easiest to understand that way. So at the bottom, you have your fort and your naval fort. Um, these buildings inflict an attack penalty of minus 15% for each fort level on the attacker in a naval invasion in combat. Uh, land forts do the same, uh, except from land to land combat. You can put forts anywhere, and there's you can have up to 10 levels of forts. So, for example, suppose we wanted to fortify the absolute heck out of central London here. We can queue up five levels of forts here in this urban uh, space in the greater London area. Um, and if we wanted to build... If we suppose, for example, we thought we expected an... Operation Sea Lion situation, we could build ourselves a Churchill line right here. Uh, and we let's go ahead and build up three levels of forts and then three here. And then we'll build ourselves some naval defense forts, some coastal forts here on our three. Oh, actually, uh, Dover already had this is Dover, right? Dover, yes, uh, already has some coastal forts in it, which is pretty cool. I wonder if that just represents how the cliffs are completely unattackable. We'll put three levels here as well, and then another three over here in Plymouth. Um, and if we wanted an additional fallback line, we could place that, say, all along this river here in the East Midlands, and then one here uh, just east of Cardiff, and then we'll put a couple each in these zones here in Birmingham. So this would create a nice, solid defensive line along these two rivers that would allow you to lock down uh, both an invasion here and into Sussex, and then if Sussex and London fall, you can block up this area. And that is overall a very effective defense. Um, each of these forts would provide a minus 45% penalty to the incoming damage of uh, attacks into those hexes, uh, into those 
uh, provinces, and that would be extremely effective. So, that's how forts work, and naval forts are, are similar. Um, and you can see these lined up on the, uh, the tree here, uh, on, the, uh, on the queue here. Scroll bar is being a little silly right now, but that's all right. Um, the next thing I want to draw your attention to is naval bases. Um, if we click this button, you can see all the naval bases all throughout my uh, all throughout the British Isles. You can see we got one here, one here, one here, uh, one's here, 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 and here and here. Um, those are places that you can dock ships to repair them. Uh, there are also places that can uh, see supply transported from a naval convoy to being on the ground supply network. Um, they are crucially important for doing naval invasions, and if you do a naval invasion without taking the sea forts, do not expect to... Uh, sorry, without taking the uh, naval bases, do not expect to be able to get very far at all just is what it is. Um, you can deploy ships at a naval base, and you can also uh, send trade from a naval base via the convoy system. Uh, next, we're going to talk about supply hubs and railways. A supply hub is basically a distro point of supply off of the rail network. So my capital hub is here in London, and then I've got other supply hubs here uh, here in uh, Birmingham, here in Sheffield, uh, another one here in in, uh, in Liverpool, and uh, last I got one here in Dumfries, one in Edinburgh, and one here in Glasgow. Uh, one way up here at Inverness, and another over here in Aberdeen. So we got a lot of supply hubs. You'll notice you get this crate icon. It's I don't know why I'm zooming in to make the icon bigger. That's not going to help. Um, you notice you get this crate icon next to the anchor icon for naval bases, and that's because naval bases are all supply hubs. You can absolutely distribute supply directly from a naval base. Um, supply hubs can be manually built, but just be aware they take forever. Just an abominable quantity of uh, construction. And to give you a sense of this... Um, a, uh, a civilian factory costs uh, 1,800 production. A military factory, 7,200. Each level of fort costs 500 plus 500 per existing level of fort. Um, so 3,000 total to get from 0 to 3. Uh, naval base is 5,000 plus 1,000 per existing level of naval base. A supply hub is... 20,000, so it's two civilian factories worth. It's extremely long. Uh, construction time, you will not end up building a whole lot of these. Uh, lastly, at the bottom, you have your railways. So suppose, for example, I am... I'm playing as Britain, so let's let's take a look somewhere where the na where the railways are not as good. So here in Africa, we've got some real real shortages of railways here. So if I want to draw a railway down to connect my uh, supply hubs here in Kenya to the ones up here in the Sudan, um, I can draw that. And what that's going to do is that's going to count as all one uh, railway here. And it's going to list it as Khartoum to the Zainia to the Rift Valley. Um, if I wanted to break one off here to the border of... Uh, French Imperial Territory, I could do that, and that would break this into two railway segments, although I think it's still counting them as one in this situation. Suppose I wanted to connect up the railways uh, over here to South Africa, I can absolutely do that as well. So this is how railways are built. What I'm doing is I'm clicking and I'm, I'm not dragging, I'm just hovering, and this allows me to do all this stuff. And now my railways are properly connected up in Africa, at least a little bit. Um, railways have five levels, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. The higher level the railway, the more supply can be transported on it. So, for example, the railway from London to Birmingham is uh, level one. And that means Birmingham's uh, 
capacity for supply is only 15. Uh, however, the one over here in... Uh, what town is this? Is this a town? This is just the Greater London area. Um, the one over here in the Greater London area is the level 3 railway. So this one has a ra uh, supply capacity of 25, similar to this one. Um, I don't know, these are due to the size of the naval base, I think. Yes. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, for land, it's definitely dependent on the size of the railway. So if I were to upgrade this railway to level 3, this would increase in its overall ability to distribute supplies. Um, and as you can see, if I mouse over this, supply connection from Capital 15, uh, railway bottlenecks the London to Birmingham line from level 1, uh, 15 trains needed one out of one. So that's very briefly how supply networks are constructed and improved. Um, and that's... It. But the, the primary takeaway is... I would also need to increase this. Um, the primary takeaway is the level of the railway is going to determine how much supply is going to be available at the hub. Um, so, next let's talk about state-level buildings and shared building slots. We're going to go up to here to the top for the state-level buildings. Here's the thing about state-level buildings. You can always build state-level buildings in whatever state you have. Um, these are completely... Uh, irrespective of one another. And let's talk about the one after another. First at the top here is infrastructure. What infrastructure is going to do is it's it exists at the state level. So you'll notice the Greater London area is 5 out of 5. It's got 5 levels. Um, it costs 6000 to build one level of infrastructure. Um, and it provides a variety of benefits. Number one, it increases the efficiency of distribution of supply out from the hub to the uh, hex, to, not hexes, uh, to the provinces around it. So the higher the level of infrastructure, the farther out from the hub the supplies are going to go when you motorize one of these hubs. So for example, if I motorize this hub fully, it's going to cover this whole area. And that's because infrastructure in England is pretty good. Um, in contrast, if I grab this supply hub and I motorize this, it's still going to get a pretty decent territory, but these are only a few provinces away here. Um, it's not going to get nearly as, uh, as large an area as if I motorize this one in Cairo here. We've got pretty decent infrastructure here. So that's what uh that's one benefit of infrastructure another benefit of infrastructure is it increases resource output so you'll notice now that i'm in the build infrastructure screen you can see these icons for resources in each of these uh, states remember these are state buildings we're operating at the state level now not the uh province level so i got uh, 67 steel over here in uh lancashire if I hit that button to build up the infrastructure from 4 to 5, that's going to increase the uh, steel output by 6. Uh, I got 153 here in Yorkshire, and if I hit that button, it's going to increase it by 15. So it's a pretty substantial bonus, uh, and that bonus is shown here by the percentage infrastructure. This is going to be 20 times the level of infrastructure, and that's going to be the bonus to resource output in that state. So, for example, uh, if we're going to use Yorkshire as an example, uh, how easy is this math? It's not as easy as it could be. The total is 168, which tells us that the base amount of steel being produced by the state is actually... The Gen Cat math hours here. Uh, 83. And we're currently getting 80% off of the infrastructure, bring it up to 153, and we build another, and then bring it up to 168. Uh, sorry, 84. It should have been 84. Um, so that's what infrastructure is for. The other thing this bonus applies to is building in the state. So, for example, if I build in the Greater London area with its 100% infrastructure, that is going to provide 
a 100% bonus to local construction speed for all construction projects that exist in the Greater London area. Um, that is really useful, and it means that if you build up infrastructure in the early game, it often doesn't pay off until way later, but um, particularly in states that have absolutely ridiculous numbers of building slots by the end of the game, paying for infrastructure early on can be a gamble, but it can pay off very much if you can hold your home states. Next here, you've got your air bases. Um, Britain is absolutely chock full of air bases. We got level 10 air bases all over this coast here, and we got more air bases inland, um, it, farther north and west, really, because only, only the West Midlands is not coastal. Um, air bases are where you put air units. It's very important, um, particularly. For America and the Pacific, building up air bases is critical. Um, next, you you got uh, oh, and the, so so how it works very briefly is every level of air base provides two hundred slots for air. Each air wing is about a hundred uh, planes. So if you have a level ten air base in the Greater London area, you can fly two thousand planes out of the Greater London area. Simple enough. This uh, air bases cost 1250 uh, construction mm -hmm. to build. Um, next are anti-air. This is completely local to an area. They cost 2500 to build. Um, anti-air is not a common thing to build in Hearts of Iron 4, but basically it's going to shoot at enemy planes that are in the air zone. And air zones are these pretty big animals, so... Uh, if we go here, you'll notice all of southern England is one air zone. So if you stack up a ton of anti-air in all of these province in all of these states, uh, that's going to provide pretty substantial bonuses. Um, anti-air doesn't do damage unless the air units are attacking buildings in the state. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, tactical bombers bombing uh, infrastructure factories, etc., uh, or bombing the logistics network. In that case, the interior is going to apply, otherwise it's not. Um, as far as combat air is concerned, anti-air only reduces the air superiority percentage the air enemies can accrue. So if you've got a bunch of anti-air, they're going to need a lot more planes in order to get air superiority. Not that big of a deal, but, uh, but interesting. Um, if you have AA in your units, those units can deal damage, but only to planes that are attacking them personally. Uh, the, the unit level AA will not deal any damage to strategic bombing that's happening in the same area. Only air support aircraft that are attacking the particular unit involved. Fun fact, if a unit has maintenance uh, support or is part of a general with the scavenger... Um, trait is led by a general scavenger trait uh, you can actually accrue a small number of casts through uh, having an equipment capture ratio because the capture ratio just captures a majority of the equipment that the unit destroys and if some of the equipment the unit destroys is enemy planes you can capture some of those planes it's a weird not really exploit but um, a weird funny little thing Last year's radar stations, they cost 3375 construction to build. Um, England has quite a few of them already. It's currently very early in the game, so we can't build very large radar stations. As you can see, the radius of these stations is pretty small. If we were able to improve one of these up to level 2, it shows you the larger uh, radius. Um, there are a total of six levels of radar stations, and the higher levels are researched over time using the engineering research tree over here. Finally, we get to the shared building slots. And what's important about these is that these buildings all use the same slot. So, for example, in the East Midlands, we've got six total building slots, and we've got three currently available. The other three are occupied currently by a military factory, a military factory, and a civilian factory. We are going to be able to double the number of slots available in each of these uh, states over the course of the game, but 
for now, it's pretty limited. Here are the things you can build in those slots. First, you got your, your military factories. Very common to build military factories in Hearts of Iron 4. Every time you get a military factory built, it fills into your production lines. Next is a civilian factory. You build a civilian factory, it outputs construction instead of production. In other words, it goes into this total, and you start building buildings with it. A naval dockyard is the same as the dockyards we've got over here listed in our construction, uh, under in our production rather. Um, those are going to be used to build ships. So those are the three main things you're going to build the most of in all of your shared building slots. Here are the others. Uh, and, and just to give you those totals again, construction costs for military factories is 7200 For civilian factories, it's uh, 10800 so one and a half times that. For dockyards, it's 6400 so I think that's 80% of that. Next, you've got fuel silos. These provide 100,000 fuel capacity. Um, they... You can only build three of these in any given state, uh, and they increase the amount of fuel you can hold. Over here are synthetic refineries. They provide oil and fuel, um, depending on your synthetic uh, oil technologies. Um, the Sorry, I said oil and fuel. I think I meant to say rubber and fuel. Rubber lets you build certain different uh, types of equipment, and then fuel is fuel, which you use for all sorts of things. These two are also very common things to build. Finally, uh, and these two are limited to three per uh, per state of, I, of each of them. So you can only have a total of three synthetic refineries and three fuel silos in each state. Doesn't mean it's necessarily best to build a bunch of those, um, but you should build as many as you need. Next, you got your rare buildings that are unlocked through... Uh, and by the way, fuel silos and synthetic refineries are unlocked through technology. Um, over here in the Industry tab, Fuel Storage is a 1936 tech that unlocks fuel silos. And then Synthetic Oil Experiments is a 1936 tech that unlocks the synthetic refineries. The last two types of shared buildings are also unlocked through technology, but much later in the game. Um, this is the rocket site. It costs 6400 to construct and builds rockets, which you can uh, shoot out of it at enemy states for strategic bombing purposes. Um, I'm not a giant fan of rocketry, but there are definitely some uses for it. And then finally, these are nuclear reactors. They cost 30000 to build. And once you've got the nuclear bombs technology, nuclear reactors will very, very slowly generate nuclear bombs. Um, these are both uh, unlocked through technologies as well here in the engineering tree. The experimental rockets uh, unlocks the rocket site, and then these subsequent rocket technologies allow you to unlock better missiles. Uh, in 1943, 1944... 1945 and 1946, and then the atomic research uh, tech in 1943 nuclear reactor unlocks building the reactors, and then 1945 you can start outputting the bombs. Uh, that is about it for construction. Nice short explainer here. I say nice short as though it hasn't been half an hour. Um, didn't turn out to be as short an explainer as it could have been, but that is what it is. Uh, I hope that helps you see what I'm doing when I'm building up my industry. Uh, the one last thing I want to draw your attention to is that I talked about these, the most important technologies in the game here. One of the things these do is increase max factories in the state. And what that means is it's just going to increase the number of shared building slots you have in each of your states. So that's one of the main reasons that those technologies are super important. That's it for this explainer. I've had fun. I hope you all have had fun. And I'll see you all on the other side.